Good day. Creating a sequel is never an easy prospect. Many of our great and long-lasting franchises were only ever supposed to be one entry. One does not simply make a great work. One does not simply plan a work to transcend all that has come before. A great work must be born from the fires of passion and providence. The creator or creators must be fully engaged in the process of creation and the face of reality must smile upon the creators to ensure that the work goes beyond what once they thought was impossible. Following up a great work is fraught with peril, hence why so few sequels ever come close to the original work, and why in many instances the original great work will reign supreme throughout time. Halo Combat Evolved was developed by Bungie and released in 2001, over 20 years ago, and yet the franchise still lives. Halo was made with passion, and due to several events during its development, it would become one of the great pillars of first person shooting. None of its greatness was really planned beforehand, and it was never supposed to be the killer app for the Xbox. Instead, it was supposed to tie gamers over for a third person shooter called Brute Force, a now forgotten game and a stillborn franchise. Bungie had originally assumed Halo to be a one-off game, but its absolutely surprising success led to them developing a sequel and thus giving birth to a franchise. The year was 2003. A young General Lutz was getting back into console gaming after a one-year hiatus from gaming. I tried a number of consoles, but Halo sold me on the maturing Xbox platform. The gameplay was something new. You could control vehicles in a small, open world. The linear levels had great gunplay and the enemies were memorable and fun to fight due to their AI. The story was, in a word, amazing for 2003, and today for that matter, it was cinematic in quality with epic characters and mighty deeds. Spartan 117 joined the lofty pantheon of first person shooter protagonists and rubbed shoulders with the likes of Doom Guy and Jedi Master Kyle Katarn. To say that I was hyped for a sequel was a substantial understatement. I had a Master Chief action figure, all the books, and I was ready for the next game. And in 2004, it would arrive. Halo 2 had a massive marketing blitz. I had more Master Chief figures, although I was annoyed at the Mjolnir Mark VI design, asking the seller why they have to change it. I would add the amazing soundtrack CD with all of its 2004 musical goodness. I even had the calendar, and somewhere in a sea of boxes, it waits for the day when it is August 14th, 2004 yet again. I had the special metal edition pre-ordered from EB Games. The day finally arrived that I could finally play the greatness of Halo 2. It was legendary. I blew through it in a week and heard the immortal lines of, Sir, finishing this fight. 10 minutes before marching band practice. For years later, I would play Halo 2 over and over again. At the time of Halo 2's release, there was some criticism of the Halo 2 campaign, and I had a friend at the time that remarked that it sucked. Such a opinion left me aghast and agog at such heresy. Over time, however, I would come to echo those heretical words. As the years grew between playthroughs, I came to feel that Halo 2 was the worst game, well, Halo 5 notwithstanding, in the series. However, I live-streamed the game in either the space future of 2022 or the primordial days of 2022, depending on when this video is being watched. I wanted to denigrate the game to hell and gone, but as I played the game, I found that I still loved it. And at the end, when I heard for the first time in 15 years, Sir, finishing this fight. Instead of booing the game, I cheered it! Halo 2, like Halo 1 before it, had the passion of the creator and the providence of the divine on its side. While it did not reach the lofty heights of the previous great work, it did manage, despite a 10-month development time, reach the lofty heights of Alpha Prime. And now, Spartans, let's load up the BR-55 and jump feet first into the excellence of Halo 2. Halo Combat Evolved made incremental evolutions to the first-person shooter genre as a whole. Some of those evolutions were good, and some were bad, or at the very least, not so good. It gave you open world spaces to fight in, and while that wasn't totally new as of 2001, Halo made it less awkward. Halo 1 also introduced the two-weapon rule. This was meant to make the player be more strategic about weapon choice, but just made people annoyed at having to leave a good gun behind. Sadly, the two-weapon rule would later become the norm. 
Halo 2 evolves the first person shooter genre yet again for the better and for the way worse. In Halo 1, you had a health bar and a recharging shield bar. Once that shield went down, you had a small number of hits, and the only way to heal was to find rare medkits. This made for a tense game where you had to be really careful when you were down to one square of health. Come Halo 2, you now had the bloody regenerative health system. While Halo 2 wouldn't be the first, it was the game that popularized it and thus brought that abominable system to the forefront of game design. In Halo 2, once that shield goes down, you can only take a couple of hits before death. But once that shield goes back up again, you are perfectly fine. Thankfully, the game is still challenging, but the regenerative health system would become the bane of the first person shooter game design ever after. The two weapon rule still remains and it's as annoying as ever and Halo 2 would remove the two most iconic and transcendent weapons of the franchise, the M60 pistol and the MA5B carbine. Never would those two weapons appear again, and instead we are left with the Magnum and the Battle Rifle. Both weapons would go on to be seen throughout the entire rest of the franchise, and they were first teased in the prequel novel, Halo First Strike. Although the Magnum in the novel sounded way cooler than what we got. The Magnum is alright, but has no zoom and is way less powerful. The BR-55 is pretty okay with decent damage and zoom, but neither weapon would reach the lofty heights of what came before. Halo 2 did give us one really iconic weapon though, the Plasma Sword. This weapon appeared in Halo 1 but was unusable after you killed an elite as it would self-destruct. Here you can unleash your inner samurai and cut shit up. It is a fun weapon to use and added a new dimension to the Halo franchise, the Jackal Sniper Rifle. This was a weapon that was both loved and hated by many Halo 2 players. It was loved for its high damage and nice long range abilities and hated because the Jackal Snipers could one shot you from across the bloody map. It would appear again in various other Halo games but would be nerfed considerably. The Covenant Carbine is introduced here and is the counterpart to the BR-55. It can drain the Elite Shields fairly quickly, but I prefer my true UNSC blue, dammit. Halo 2 would introduce dual wielding and this would carry on through Halo 3, although the 343 Industries developed games would drop this. Dual wielding is pretty fun, but I don't feel like it adds all that much to gameplay. It does however make the needlers very very broken and if I remember correctly, the dual wielding needlers was dropped in Halo 3, and for good reason because it was definitely a in the game sort of combination. Personally though, I never really use dual wielding all that much as I prefer to stick to rifles. Turrets make an appearance, but they are immobile and they feel a bit like an afterthought, as they are never that useful. The player can now ride in vehicles instead of driving them. As we know now, the AI just wasn't up to the task, but it wasn't quite as bad as people say it is. It's still bad, but it's very, very close, like on the cusp of being good. If they just could move a little more, the AI might have worked. This feature would also be dropped going forward. Vehicle hijacking would make its debut and it works well and allows you to get a Wraith tank fairly easily. But don't let that fool you, the game is not easy, in fact it's really bloody hard. Much harder in fact than the preceding Halo 1 and the games going forward. Enemies do more damage, come in higher numbers, and you now have flying enemies. You got bullet sponges, and you have the fucking jackal snipers. All of this combines to make Halo 2 the hardest game in the entire bloody franchise franchise, but that makes this one of the funnest games in the franchise as well, so I guess it balances out. Halo 2 would introduce a new major character, Thel Vadami, aka the Arbiter. His gameplay is identical to Master Chief, but with a cloaking device in the place of a flashlight. I think the uh, RB gets a better deal on that one. For a 10 month dev cycle, Halo 2 is nothing short of miraculous, especially when you take into account all the little experiments that by and large worked. Bungie could have just made the same game again in that 10 month dev window, but instead they took chances and proved that indeed, who dares wins. So Halo 2 in its initial form was simply too graphically complex for the weak hardware on the original Xbox, and thus that initial design had to be completely scrapped and Bungie had to start all over again, and in 10 months we still got a pretty bloody good looking game. Graphically, Halo 2 looks really amazing for 2004, almost on par with Doom 3 itself. The levels are extremely large and all the details make them even more impressive. The 3D models for Master Chief and Arbiter look amazing for original Xbox, and the weapons were also quite impressive as well, but that impressiveness comes at a price. 
you've got a really low frame rate and lots and lots of texture pop-ins. And graphical glitches abound, such as in Amberclad turning invisible. The footage you're seeing here is from the original release of Halo 2 being played on the Xbox 360, and it works pretty well. The only major graphical glitch is a layering error on the second to last orbiter level. It's pretty noticeable, but it does not make the level unplayable. The original release of Halo 2 is by far my favorite version of the game. The Master Chief Collection, released both on Xbox One and PC, have the physics a bit messy messed up for the Warthogs to the point where the Warthogs are almost unplayable. Controls for the game are pretty bloody good, just like the previous game, and showed that yes, the console could run FPS games decently well. Oh, the music. This is an Alpha Prime soundtrack of the highest order, and I still listen to that bloody CD to this very day. I am not playing any of the music from Halo 2 due to copyright concerns, but rest assured, it can be found on YouTube and deserves to be added to any music lover's collection. The Halo 2 soundtrack is bar none the best in the franchise and belongs in the pantheon of game soundtracks next to the likes of Doom and Quake 2. This is a soundtrack where every song is kind of like the best song. It also features the second best version of the Halo theme. Mjolnir Mix brings in the guitar and makes the already legendary Halo theme even more excellent. However, the Halo 3 theme, aka One Final Effort, one-ups it by adding in the pianos. And I still get chills down my spine every time I listen to that version. This is Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore's best work in the Halo franchise. The soundtrack also had songs from many of the major artists in 2004, and they all turned in great performances. My favorite tracks in this OST are Peril, Ghost of Reach, Heretic Hero, Flawed Legacy, Impinned, and Emberclad, the various movements of Odyssey, and even Blow Me Away by emo band Breaking Benjamin. The best track by far is the song The Last Spartan. It plays over a super epic scene and will stick in your brain forever. There are two volumes of the soundtrack CD released. Volume 1 came out shortly before the game and is the CD I had and still do have. Volume 2 would be released almost two years later for some reason, and I do not have that in my personal collection. Whichever version you listen to, the OST wastes not a single minute of its runtime. Sounds are cinematic, and voice acting evolved what one expected from a game. What we have here is a game that has Alpha Prime gameplay with movie quality cutscenes. The graphics for the cutscenes were eye opening for 2004, and the VA work matched. Everyone sends a few phoned in Marines, and Covenant sound like they were recording lines for a blockbuster release. Steve Downs turns in a stellar performance as always. Keith David turns in a split jaw dropping performance as the Arbiter. David Scully does an even better job this time around as the Spartan One, spoiler, Command Master Sergeant Johnson. The villains get some amazing voice work and make them stand out as some of the best in the FPS genre in general. Michael Wincott plays the evil backstabber, the prophet of truth. Kevin Michael Richardson turns in a suitably bastardly performance as Truth Lackey, the brute chieftain Tartarus. Every bloody person takes this game seriously, and it shows. So while I said Halo 2 was only Alpha Prime, I meant it was only Alpha Prime in my book. It really is a great work due to one major element, multiplayer. While I'm not a multiplayer gamer, multiplayer is a major part of gaming and for many is a major part of their gaming lives. And Halo 2 is a great work for what Bungie brought to the multiplayer gaming scene. It finally, once and for all, took multiplayer from being predominantly the domain of the PC and brought it to the console. Halo 2 and Xbox Live changed the face of gaming forever. For better and worse, I suppose. It was very popular in its day, and it kept going until the very last second the servers were up. And it is still played today via Xlink Kai. I personally only ever played Halo 2 once multiplayer, and all I did was die. A lot. The fact is, though, I owe a debt of gratitude to Halo 2, as years later I would get into multiplayer gaming for a little bit on Xbox Live, and I would play a great deal of Halo 3 on Xbox 360 with friends. Although, to be perfectly frank, I always preferred COD Modern Warfare 3 to Halo 3. Yes, I am a heretic. The story as of 2004 was bleak. It was the late 26th century. The war against the Covenant had been one defeat after another. The super soldaten known as the Spartan Twos would generally win on the ground, but the shieldless and directed energy weapon-less human ships would usually be eradicated all the same. 
The battle for Halo was a major victory for humanity. It not only stopped the Covenant from securing an AI, but Master Chief Spartan 117 managed to stop Halo from destroying all life in the galaxy. On top of that, he also managed to defeat a parasitic organism known as the Flood. It was a mighty victory, but the road to humanity surviving in the face of the Covenant Hordes was far from clear. After the Battle of Alpha Halo, Master Chief managed to find a small group of survivors with Sergeant Avery Johnson amongst them. He also managed to find a small number of still living Spartan 2s on the now glassed planet of Reach. At the end of the novel, First Strike, released just prior to Halo 2, we read of another epic victory by Chief and his Spartan 2s. He and a small team destroy the Covenant battle station unyielding Hierophant and destroy a major part of a Covenant battle fleet that was heading to Earth. With Earth now known to the foul hordes of godless Xenos, it was time for the next chapter in the Halo Saga. The game begins with a lengthy cutscene that juxtaposes the Chief with a new character, Thel Vanami. Turns out that Othel was Chief's primary antagonist in the first game, and as Chief is celebrated by Lord Hood, voiced by Ron Perlman, Thel is disgraced by the Covenant leadership for his failure to stop Master Chief from destroying Halo. Remember, first person shooter. Most movies aren't this well written. The opening cutscene also introduces Master Chief's supporting cast. You have the exuberance of Command Master Sergeant Avery Johnson contrasted with the stoicness of Master Chief. Command Master Sergeant Avery Johnson gets a lot of characterization in this game, but he has actually been with the Halo franchise since the very first Halo work. He appeared as a surviving Marine in Halo Fall of Reach, and then was a sort of character in Halo Combat Evolved. He wasn't really a character as he was generally just a kind of cool Marine that was in the background. And of course he did appear in the very final secret legendary cutscene of Halo Combat Evolved, but he wasn't taken that seriously. And now as of Halo 2, he is a fully fledged character and is an excellent sidekick to the great Master Chief. We further get introduced to Captain Keys' daughter, Miranda. So much for no females in gaming. This character came out of nowhere as nothing in the prior game or books even hinted at Keys having a daughter. I honestly prefer her original look as the hair just doesn't look quite right in the anniversary edition. Like father, like daughter, am I right? The remnants of the fleet that was stationed at Unyielding Hierophant attack Earth during Chief's award ceremony and it's time for him to get a weapon and get to slaying. Humanity has a number of super Mac guns in orbit around Earth, and they can, according to Sergeant Johnson, put a round clean through a Covenant capital ship. Sadly, such super Macs still didn't stem the tide at Reach. Here, the Covenant attack the stations with boarding parties and leave little gifts in the guise of antimatter bombs. As you would expect, Chief returns the favor in what is without a doubt the most epic scene in all of Halo. Chief explosively leaves the station and flies through space to a Covenant cruiser, whereupon he gives them back their bomb. And for a brick, he flies pretty good. An explosive opener that sets the tone for the chief portion of the game. It's now time to head to the surface and stop the Prophet of Regret. The concept of the Prophets being the leadership cast of the Covenant has been with Halo since before the first game even came out, and it's awesome that in the second game they are featured as the primary antagonists. Chief fights through the war-torn streets of Mombasa, takes on Jackal Snipers, and finally does battle with a Scarab. Uh, where did that come from? Sergeant Johnson talks about simulations, but prior to Halo 2, it was never mentioned, and seriously, why does this reasonable Marine, voiced by Michelle Rodriguez, think a 50 caliber from World War II, damn JMB builds him to last, or a rocket could take down a Godzilla-sized mech? Anyway, the mech gets taken out, and you gotta bug out as Regret initiates a jump to slip space in an atmosphere. In the preceding novel, a Covenant AI stole that bit of tech from Cortana, the bastard. Miranda, being as ballsy as her father, heads in after him with the chief in tow. The game then slows down a bit. For the better, not the worse. We now enter the Arbiter campaign. The boys at Bungie were nothing short of genius when it came to adding Thel Vidami. The chief was envisioned as the player, and in the novel First Strike, his character arc comes to a close anyway. In that novel, he regained his humanity, and while still loyal to the UNSC, he now fought firmly to save humanity, and not just because he was ordered to do so. In order for this game to have a satisfying story, we needed a new character that could grow. Thel Vidami is not a good guy as the game begins. He is a genocide idle maniac by human standards. All the death and destruction that happens in Halo 1? Yeah, that's on him. So seeing him disgraced, seeing him stripped of all that he holds dear, yeah, that's pretty satisfying. 
Elites, aka Sanghili, are more or less space samurai and follow a warrior's code. So not only does Thel lose his rank, his keep, aka his clan, loses theirs too. Good. The Prophet of Truth, being a conniving genocidal bastard, still sees some use for the disgraced shipmaster and offers him the chance to take up the mantle of the Arbiter, a holy warrior that is thrown into suicidal missions where death is the most likely outcome. You can see the juxtaposition between Thel and Chief. Chief is a mighty warrior, and Thel is a mighty warrior. Chief used to fight without question, and Thel still does. Most novels are not this complex. Your first mission as the Arbiter is to kill the leader of some heretics. The heretic leader found the wayward monitor of Alpha Halo 343. Guilty Spark. Spark told him what Halos really do. In the Covenant religion, the Halos are supposed to light the path to the Great Journey. Oh dear. In addition to all this great stuff, we get introduced to yet another iconic character, the Shipmaster. He is initially dismissive of the Arbiter, but comes around as the Arbiter impresses him with his combat prowess. The first mission for the Arbiter takes place on a station in the middle of a gas giant. It's pretty bloody fun. You got a lot of corridor shootouts and a cool outdoor battle in a banshee. However, in places we start to see where the 10 months required some corners to be cut. You get a really long elevator sequence that pads out the game time. You eventually corner the heretic leader and have to flush him out by destroying some cables holding up the station. This is as awesome as it sounds, and then the fight against the heretic leader is decent if a bit easy. Well, it's easy on normal at least. You secure the monitor, but Tartarus rears his ugly Xenos head to steal it from you. And then BOOM! Chief blasts back onto the scene. He and the crew of the Enamor Clad arrive in orbit around a new Halo ring. The Coveys have found Delta Halo and are trying to locate the Index, aka the Sacred Icon. Chief and company head down to the planet via HVV orbital insertion vehicles. And had one read the novelization prior to the game, one would know everything that's going on right now. In Halo 1's novelization, we got introduced to the ODSTs for the first time. And here we finally get to see them in action in a game. And this is exactly what we read in the novelization. It's just awesome that as of Halo 2 at least, Bungie tried to maintain canonicity between the novels and the games. Chief arrives on the planet and does what he does best. We get a good number of open areas, but the open areas on Delta Halo are sadly a bit more linear than what we got in the first game. This level here is probably, if not the most, a close second to the most important level in all of Halo, at least the original trilogy. Chief almost single-handedly sets in motion the events to win the war for humanity. It is during the events of this level that Master Chief has given the order by Miranda Keys to find and kill the Prophet of Regret. One neat detail is that the Halo theme exists in the game as a sermon being given by Regret himself. The game gets super epic when you reach Regret's temple. An entire Covenant armada shows up along with High Charity, the Death Star sized Mobile Covenant Capital. This awesome fleet sets the stage for the most epic of showdowns. To kill Regret, you have to fight through an entire army of Sangheli Honor Guardsmen, and then you have to take down Regret himself. You beat the fuck out of regret, getting revenge for all the billions of lives lost due to his genocidal orders. Upon his death, the Covenant begin glassing the temple in retaliation, and Chief jumps into the water, seemingly lost until a hentai tentacle pulls him away to an uncertain fate. We then transition back to the Arbiter. Arbiter's level takes place after Chief kills regret, and Arbiter sees the elites being replaced as honor guards by brutes. Truth dismisses it as just politics. In reality, Truth had grown concerned about the Elite and wanted them removed from the Covenant to secure his own power. The death of Regret played into his hands, and thus his timetable of betrayal has been moved up. The Arbiter level is even more impressive than Chief's. Lots of good fights and highly impressive level architecture and super cool outdoor areas that, while linear, are still fun. It is during this level that you see a rather interesting detail. That is the Enamberclad. Why it's there? I don't know. Where it's going? Who knows? Who's controlling it? The game doesn't bother to tell us, but it's a detail that one can quite easily miss. I played Halo 2 I don't know how many times back in the day, and I never saw that. It was only until I played it recently for a live stream that I just so happened to see the Enamorclad flying up there, and it's a great detail. If only we knew what it was doing. You team up again with the Shiftmaster, and then we get padding. 
A lot of it. You gotta ride a gondola. You had to do this in the chief level, but for Arby, it seems even more boring. You fight some flood here and there, and in orbit around Delta Halo, numerous flood control dropships are trying to escape, and one ship in orbit even tries to deliberately get the crew infected, as the captain thinks the flood are holy. Thankfully, he gets stabbed for his stupidity. The Arbiter eventually reaches the Index Room and does battle with Sergeant Johnson and Miranda. Due to the rushed nature of the game, we don't really know what happened to the crew of Neverclad, and that mystery has always been a major issue I've had with the game. It is an important detail that should have been flashed out in, oh, I don't know, a book? But for whatever reason, Halo 2 never got a novelization. I get why the fate of the Neverclad crew was glossed over, as it is not that important to the narrative of Chief and Arby, but it's still a glaring omission nonetheless. Arbiter, after getting the index key it gets betrayed by the bastard Tartarus and hurled into the abyss. This next part of the game shows just how desperate Bungie was to get a quality product out on time. There were many better ways for this transition to have been done. Sadly, you need time to make those better ways, but we see yet again the genius. Yeah, I'm flating them because when you think about it, it is kind of genius. You need Chief and Arby to get to where the plot requires them to be. And you gotta do it fast. And you gotta do it in such a way so as not to be filled with the bull shisa. So you have to, well, have D. Bradley Baker kidnap them and take them to his love dungeon. Yes, D. Bradley Baker voices the second major villain in the true Halo trilogy, Gravemind, the debased leader of the Parasite, the Flood. He acts all buddy-buddy with Chief and Arby, gives them some expedition, and holy shit, a partially zombified regret has got to be the creepiest thing in the game. He explains to Arbiter what the Halo rings do, and fills in people who play a second game first. Who does that? Chief tries to reason with Arby, but as you would expect, Thel will have none of it. The purpose of this super cool scene is to get the plot moving. Chief needs to get to the Prophet of Truth to try and stop him. Instead of complicated plans to sneak onto High Charity, Grave Mind just teleports in there. Not really sure why you couldn't do this with other Flood, but whatever. And then Thel needs to get after Tartarus. So Grave Mind also just teleports him. Not sure why he doesn't teleport Flood everywhere, but whatever. The teleports are justified to a certain extent by the fact that all three factions need to find the Index before Truth fires Halo and kills everything. Still though, it doesn't explain why Grave Mind can't just teleport thousands and thousands of Flood to these locations, but if he did that, we wouldn't have a story now, would we? So despite this thing being a major league cop-out, it works, and it works better than one would expect, and is the hallmark of true excellence. So Chief gets to fight through High Charity, and for the first time, we get to slay some brutes. They were first introduced to the novel First Strike, and were treated as a new Covenant species. They were super creepy and powerful enough to kill a fully armed and armored and shielded Spartan in one hit with a brute shot. Here, they're exactly the same. They hurt and take a shit ton of damage before dying. And if you kill all but one, they rage and they hurt even more. The level has you leave Cortana behind so that she can hack High Charity. She says you can pick her up later. Uh... It is during High Charity that we see the opening moves of the Covenant Great Schism. Thanks to Master Chief killing the Prophet of Regret, the elites are out of favor. And that moves up the Prophet of Truth's timetable to kill all the elites. And thus the Brutes, wanting to be the top dogs in the Covenant hierarchy, are tasked with the Prophet of Truth to kill all of the elites. This goes about like what you would expect. The elites fight back, and thus there is a giant Covenant Civil War. This gives humanity a little bit of breathing room to try and not go extinct. These Covenant battles are pretty bloody cool, and at this time, Master Chief has no reason to work with the Elites, so you end up fighting both Elites and Brutes. It is an example of excellent storytelling, and it's something that you would not expect in a game that was developed in 10 bloody months. The Covenant Great Schism would go on to pay dividends in Halo 3. High Charity is a fairly impressive level, even if it doesn't have that much narrative weight because Chief doesn't actually get to do anything. You really just fight to a cutscene wherein you just miss the Prophet of Truth as some flood control dropships show up. Huh, how'd that happen? Once again, the lack of knowledge as to what happened to the Inanimate Clad's crew really rankles. The Prophet of Mercy gets none as he gets killed by a flood and Truth says, fuck this, I'm out, and leaves High Charity to its fate and heads the Forerunner Dreadnought that is powering High Charity. Meanwhile, in the Arbiter's campaign, Thel is teleported to a random area on Delta Halo. He learns the awful truth of the Covenant Great Schism and gets to killing brutes and gathering allies, and attempts to find the Shipmaster in order to figure out just what the 
hell he needs to do. The last chief level is pretty tough as you now have to fight Flood and Coveys. It's a very impressive level and ends on a major tearjerker. You gotta leave Cortana behind. She says, don't make a girl a promise you can't keep. Back in 2004, I was like, yeah, whatever. In 2022, I got a little misty-eyed at that point. After this, the Cheap leaps into a gravity field that deposits him on the Forerunner Dreadnought. Originally, there was supposed to be a Warthog run here, and with mod tools, you can add it back in. However, I feel this might have ruined the pacing and would have cheapened the one at the end of Halo 3. The final Arbiter mission is pretty bloody good. It has you teaming up with Command Master Sergeant Johnson as you try to stop Tartarus from lighting the rings. Johnson takes over a scarab and you provide cover in a banshee. It's fun, but short-lived. The game ends with you facing off against your nemesis Tartarus. Thel tries to talk some sense into King Bastard, but to no avail, and you have to blast him in the face. The boss fight can be tough if you don't use the right weapons. You stop the rings from going off and set the stage for Halo 3. Chief doesn't get a final battle, instead the game ends with him saying the immortal line, Sir, finishing this fight. In 2004, I was stunned by the ending. It was epic, it was monumental, it was expensive. I know they didn't plan it this way, but by ending on such an explosive fucking cliffhanger, it guaranteed the fans of the series would go out and buy the third game, and by extension, the Xbox 360. It's an ending that taken in a vacuum might seem kind of crap, but the narrative the game was presenting did get proper closure. The real main character of Halo 2 was not Master Chief, it was Thel Vadami. Thel Vidami has the most narrative weight in this entire game. We see his fall, and we see his rise, and at the end of the game, we see him finally reject the Covenant for the pack of lies that it is. Master Chief, by contrast, doesn't change altogether that much throughout the game. He is always the stoic badass hero as he should be. Halo 2 was a great work for the masses and an alpha prime game for me. It had the passion of the developers and the providence of the divine, and unlike a great many sequels, it stood the test of time and scrutiny when compared to the previous great work of Halo Combat Evolved. Halo 2 would be followed up by another great work in 2007, Halo 3. It would close the narrative of the Human Covenant War and end on a major high note. It would advance the franchise again with new gameplay elements and would feature a narrative as good or better than Halo 2's. The entire Halo trilogy is to gaming as Star Wars was to cinema. It was a great work. It had all the elements to make something stand out from the multitude and it brought many changes to gaming. It inspired many games after it and stands tall as the best overall first person shooter trilogy to date. Halo 2, while rough in some places, still stands as as a game that I cannot recommend enough. I am General Lots, and I am going to wish you good Halo 3 and good Halo 3 ODST or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and please consider leaving a like or a comment as the algorithm desires your soul. And I want to thank all those fans who have supported this channel, both past and present.